with us already. I hope that you've been blessed. You can leave and say, God has been with me this morning. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who was my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by, the, and by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he, came, when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him, and passed by on the other side. But as a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host. He said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves. He said, He that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. As we get ready to pray this morning, I'd like for you to bow your heads for a moment as we ask the Lord to grace the sanctuary and everyone being in their place this morning for what the Lord has put on our heart today. Father, this morning we're thankful for the privilege to hear the Word of God. I'm thankful myself for the ability to share the Word of God. I'm asking you this morning, God, to grace this sanctuary with your presence, with your will, with your power. I ask you, Lord, for the next few moments, God, that you'll let there be an incredible conviction. Let there be an anointing of this house. And let there be a liberty to obey you. We we'll give you praise for what is accomplished in this service this morning. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Go ahead, brother.
With the Lord's help this morning, I'm going to preach to you, those that are watching on the internet this morning, a message that I've never preached before, but something that last night, as I sat and study, tears filled my eyes as I began to weep and think about what God had laid on my heart. With God's help this morning, I'm going to preach to you on the right side of the road. There are two verses in particular this morning that I want us to think about. Verse number 31, the Bible said it by chance. There came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, the Bible said he passed on the other side. Then when we read in verse number 32, we read a very similar account with the Levite. And the Bible said when he was at that place or the place, he came and looked on him. He looked at him. But the Bible said, and he passed on the other side. Last night as I said in study, the Spirit of God dealt with me on this very title, the subject, the right side of the road. The more that God began to deal with me, I thought about the fact that we are living in a world where compassion is not always an available commodity. We're living in a world where there's a lot of hatred, violence, prejudice, cruelty. Can you say amen to that? But you see this particular parable if we could say it was started from this perspective as the Word of God unfolded. Jesus is sitting amongst the crowd and in that crowd the Bible said there is a lawyer there. This lawyer, he begins to challenge the Lord. When I looked up the original translation and I was able to understand the verbiage by which he used we may read it and think that he was simply asking an innocent question, but because of the style of the words that were used, it was more of a challenge. This lawyer asked the Lord, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus looks back at this lawyer and he says, basically, you know the law. You tell me what you have to do. So this man goes on to recite these things that we are required to do. To love God with our whole heart, our mind, soul, strength, and body. And he goes on to say that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Well, you see, the Lord realizes what he is saying. And I think this man, it begins to unfold in his own mind as he says these words. There's a common day prejudice. The Jews didn't have anything to do with the Samaritans and in the back of his mind, Brother Mike, he's probably thinking to himself, now I've asked him, what must I do? I've just told him, but that last part, I want to make sure he doesn't get me on that. So he speaks up to the Lord after he says this and he says to him basically, who is my neighbor? I love how the Lord uses this example or parable. Some may believe, and I'll explain this in a minute, that this may not have even been a parable. It may have been an actual event. But what he does is he takes this man's question and he allows the man to answer his own question. But he uses this parable and he starts off at the setting of this parable that the Lord uses takes place on the road of Judea. It's a road that connects Jerusalem and Jericho. Somewhere in between, this is a highly traveled public road. Many of the religious crowd, they traveled down this busy road. Well, in their day, what began to take place, it was very common. And this is why some believe that it could very well be a recent event that just took place that the Lord was referring to, whether we don't, we don't really know 100%. But he goes on to tell him that this common thing that began to happen, people 
would ambush those that walked down this road. They really don't know, historians don't know if it was the Romans, they don't know if it was just a band of thieves, another enemy, they really don't know. But what they do know is in this parable, the same thing that had been taking place took place in this parable. They're walking down the road, and as you've seen the little illustration that we used this morning, and we've read the text, what took place is that there is a Jew. He's walking down the road. He's minding his own business. In my mind, I'm thinking, Sister Myers, he could have very well been going to the same place that everybody else was going. Could have been going to the temple. We don't know. If this took place at night or during the day, I don't know. Very good chance it was at night time. So this man's walking down the road and he's minding his business when all of a sudden a band of thieves break out of nowhere. They grab this man. They begin to violently attack this man until that they have injured him. And what I realize is that this man is so badly injured that the Bible said, this is what the Lord said to those listening. He said he was half dead. I want you to know this morning, I've been to the hospital alongside bedsides of people that were half dead. Maybe tubes hanging out of their face and their body laid lifeless and limp in a hospital bed. Have you ever seen that before? And in my mind, that's when I see Sister Wilma when I think about this man laying on the side of the road and the Bible said that he's half dead. So here's a man that they have, Brother Eric, taken his clothes. They have stripped him naked. They've taken his dignity away. There's a very good chance that he's laying on the side of the road bleeding profusely because we read that this man had to have his wounds bandaged up, which is very common. They would leave a man dead because they don't want this man to say, hey, this person and this person did this to me. So they leave him in this condition. But what really strikes us is the fact the reason that the Lord gave this particular parable was to strike a dart into the heart of that man that was so prejudiced in his heart. And he asked the question back to the Lord, who is my neighbor? You see, because in their day, the Jews weren't supposed to have anything to do with the Samaritans. And so the Lord uses this illustration very meticulously. And he tells us a story where that you see that a priest comes walking down the road of Judea. And when he looks... He sees this beaten man that is beaten naked, laying there, probably moaning, dying on the side of the road. And when he looks at him, the Bible said that as he's walking down that road and he sees that man, in my mind, I see him move to the other side of the road. And the Bible said that the priest went to the other side of the road. Does anybody else see a problem with that? If you've ever gone down the road and you see panhandlers on the side of the road and maybe it's that same annoying guy that's always there, always begging for money and you don't feel like being bothered and you look the other way so you don't have to make eye contact so they don't have to look at you and smile and you feel guilty about giving anything that day. Amen. You might as well say amen. Some of you have been there. And so he moves to the other side of the road. And the Bible said he's a priest. I want you to understand, I'm not the first preacher that came along to tell you this, but this, if anybody should have been expected to be able or willing to offer aid and help, this was the office of this man's calling. He was called to an office that exhibited the Spirit of God and the compassion for those that are hurting and those that are, are dying. And in this case, this man is on near death's door. And so this priest he should have been the man that took the time to stop and administer help to this man. What I want you to see this morning is that this, this man is a Jew. I want this to sink in for you. This is not a Samaritan laying on the side of the road. This isn't somebody just... Uh, this is his own people. In other words, a priest. This is his own kind. This is his own type of people, if you will. And yet, this man can't even minister to his own people. Can somebody say there's a lot to be said about that? So he goes on and he sees this man moves to the other side of the road. And if that's not enough, we see another man by that we know as being a Levite. A man with a very, very high office as a, as a man of God. 
I want you to know this morning that that office was so high and that office was so holy in the kingdom of God that when you read the Old Testament, you will find that when the, tent, the tabernacle, when there was the Holy of Holies, not just anybody could go into the Holy of Holies. Amen. They say that if a man went into the Holy of Holies and he wasn't right with God, if he wasn't the, the Levite that God had put his seal of approval on, that they would tie a rope to a man's ankle. And when he went into the Holy of Holies, he had bells around the bottom of his garment. And if they ever heard those bells stop ringing, they knew something was wrong. Because you couldn't bring sin into the habitation yes, where God on, was. So they knew that if that Levite had gone into the presence of God where that ark was where the spirit and the glory of God came down they knew that if those bells stopped ringing there's something wrong inside there that man must have went in there with a foul spirit or a dirty heart and he must have died and they would pull that rope out if that was the case so what I'm saying to you this morning is uh, we're talking about a man with a high expectation on his life say amen you see folks this morning we may sit high and holy and pious about who we are. And you may be able to display your spiritual stars and stripes. Well, I've been in this thing all of my life. Preach, Pastor, I've preach. been fighting this thing all of my life. Don't you know who I am? Do you know the ministries that I've conducted? Don't you know who my name is? Let me tell you, it doesn't matter who you came up under. It doesn't matter where you used to go to church. It doesn't matter what altar that you got saved in regardless uh, if you don't have the right spirit uh, you can have the title and you can have the name uh, but if you're not in the will of God say amen it ain't the spirit of God he's not pleased with it can you say amen so we see a man that should have by all accounts at least got somebody to help this man out and as he's passing by brother Eric he sees him and he does the same thing and he moves uh, to the other side of the road uh, and if that parent the Lord says uh, and after that took place uh, here comes a man who's a Samaritan he's a man that is everybody would look at uh, and say he is the most unlikely man to minister help and aid to that man come on now so in other words uh, they knew that there was a rift between the Samaritans and the Jews uh, and that man that was a Samaritan he knew how the Jews looked and viewed him they weren't supposed to sit at the same table and eat they didn't, a lot of the Jews didn't feel like they were entitled to mercy, grace, or compassion from God. They didn't feel like they were part of the family of God. They looked at the Samaritans like the mud on the bottom of your shoe. But yet a man who knew that another man did not like him, did not care for him, most likely he's traveling down the roadside and he does something beautiful instead of moving to the other side of the road. While two men were on the wrong side of the road, the Holy Ghost spoke to me last night and told me he was on the right side of the road. Can I tell somebody this morning, it is my feeling in my spirit is that a lot of churches and a lot of pews are not just empty because people don't want it. I don't believe it's all because that we've been burnt out, played out, and nobody's interested in what we've got. I think sometimes the problem is, in many cases, is because too many of us have moved over to the other side of the road. And if it ain't a certain person, man, if it had been one of the priests that he knew, one of his buddies, would he have stopped on the side of the road? But it's a cry and shame that we've got to the place that we're like these men in many cases. This man has got to the place in his life He's got a title. He's got a religious office. Uh, but because uh, of this man's position, what we need to understand uh, is that this man has obviously got so caught up with the religious motions uh, that he has forgot uh, what God really called him to do. I preached last week, uh, or week before last, uh, about a, cream, a clean crib uh, and a barren church. Uh, let me tell somebody, the problem is, uh, is that and a lot of folks, uh, we want them to be a certain way. We want them to look a certain way. We want them to act a certain Hallelujah. way. We're not going to get our hands dirty. But the farmer 
said this morning uh, as he played the part of a Levite, he looked and said, we're not supposed to touch you. We're not supposed to. We don't want anything to do with you. Uh, come on now. You don't have to say that with your lips uh, to do that with your actions. Say, man, you know what? We've got to get back to the place. Uh, I don't care how bad they smell. I don't care how bad they look. It doesn't matter where they came from. It doesn't matter what color they are. Say amen, somebody. It doesn't matter what country they came from. It doesn't matter if they ain't like you. They don't look like you. They don't talk like you. They don't smell like you. I don't care if they reek of a meth lab. I don't care if they come off the prostitute corner and walk up into the house of God with a mini skirt about to reveal everything. Come on, somebody. When you stop moving to the other side of the road and the church gets back to the place that we get on the right side of the road. Somebody, you're gonna see these pews fill up one by one by one. You see, we can tell everybody we want to fill this church up. But if you want to fill this church up, somebody look at me and say it's time to move to the right side of the road. It's time to stop moving over here. Well, I got my plans, my agenda, my schedule, and everything else. Come on, is that the reason why that a man was about to die on the side of the road? The Bible says says to love thy neighbor as you love yourself. Is it? Come on now. Some of you, I've said this before, but you say, well, I don't love myself. Well, there's a lot of folk you blow your own mind about how much you love yourself. Come on now. I told folks in the past, I, I said, you take a picture, a group photo with you in it, uh, and pass out the photo copies. Uh, who's the first person you go looking for? Come on now. First you go now. looking for yourself. Come on. You can say you don't love yourself. Uh, some I know they battle with depression and everything else. But when we get right down to it, nobody really cares about you quite as much as sometimes you do your own self. And I tell those that are here, when we stop being so stinking selfish, come on somebody. He says, the last five dollars I've got. But if another man gets to eat, come on now. They I need that money, Brother Myers, to buy me some clothes. Come on now, when's the last time that a church member found somebody who didn't have school clothes for their children and said, honey, I don't got much. Would you be willing to go to the goodwill? I'll help you find some clothes. And I tell somebody, charity passes it all. I don't care if you got the look. I don't care if you got your hair parted just right. It doesn't matter if we get the choir singing better than the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. It doesn't matter, preacher. But Myers, Pastor Myers preaches the best sermon anybody's ever heard. If we don't got charity, the Bible said we ain't got nothing. And if we can't minister to the lost, we might as well pack it up and go home say amen, somebody. Hey. Oh this morning, I'm telling you that when I read stories like this and I hear things like this, there's something that goes off in the inside of me. The tears well up in my eyes as I think about those that are hurting. Do you know as a pastor, it ain't just the people that I pastor, but there are people on the outside and I see them in a mess and all of a sudden something grieves inside of my spirit because when you look at them, that's somebody's child. They got a mama probably and a daddy somewhere. They, 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 they belong to somebody. They might have had a wife, might have had children, but somebody cares about them. I'm going to tell you this morning, I've preached about this. It's been quite a while. But several years ago, I was here in Apopka, Florida. It's been so many years, I hope I can tell it exactly the way I remember. But I pulled up into a Cumberland Farm store right off of 441. As I was pulling up and getting out of the vehicle, there was a lady walking down the street. She was actually a beautiful woman. And when I looked and turned, she said, Sir, I looked around. I would have never thought that she was walking the street looking for somebody to solicit for payment for her drug habit. She didn't even look like the type. As I turned, she looked at me and smiled. She said, Sir. I said, Yes. She said, Is there anything I can do for you? I knew then what she meant. I stopped and I walked away from my car and I walked toward the sidewalk. Standing on the side of 441 with cars just blowing by. You feel the wind off the cars. 
I looked at this woman and I said, how did you get out here? I mean, I'm looking at this woman and I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to be realistic. How did, how, how did you end up out here? And she said, well, I started off, I got injured. She said, the doctors prescribed pain pills. She said, I got addicted to the pain pills. She said, those pain pills, when they wouldn't give me any more. She said, I was going into withdrawals and I was trying to find another way to administer to that desire that I had. And she said, so I turned to other drugs. The more she tells me, the more tears start falling down her face. I'm thinking to myself, dear God, you see, when we get to the place, I preach this message about this kind of thing, about the Samaritan and this story in the past, and something came to my mind, and that was, what is it that made this man stop and nobody else did? Now, I cannot tell you for certain, but I know how humanity works, and I know it's kind of like this. You see, has anybody ever had a time when you couldn't pay your electric bill and you're humble enough to raise your hand. Come on, you thought you might get your lights turned off. I'll tell you, when you've been there and somebody else can't pay their electric bill, you know what happens? Uh, you got more compassion because, honey, you've been there and you know what it feels like. Uh, so you know how that feels. Uh, if you've ever, never been able to pay your rent uh, and you felt like you had nobody to turn to and you were too embarrassed to ask anybody for help, then you don't know what that feels like. But when you run into somebody else, with the same problem. Something inside of you generates a, a compassion and a love and a merciful spirit about you. Especially when the love of God is in your same mouth. Amen. But I believe it like this. That it is very possible that the reason why that Samaritan man stopped when nobody else did. Could it be, Brother Steve, that there was a time in his life when somebody beat the near daylights out of him and left him for dead. And when he came by that day, he said, I know what it feels like to be on the bottom. Let me tell you, you want to see some people that will start outreach? You show me somebody that's got a burden for souls. A lot of times it's people that knows what it feels like to sit in a black dog room with a knife to their wrist ready to cut their own wrist. You show me somebody who's got a needle in their arm and after they shot up, they roll over in the bed with tears fill their eyes when they feel guilt raise up, rise up within them and they look in the mirror they hate who they're looking at. You show me somebody like that who's been down the road, who knows what it feels like to have your parents reject you, but know what it feels like to lose another job and another job while people look at you like a complete utter failure. Somebody who's lost a spouse, somebody who's lost a relationship that had lived the most of them because they couldn't get loose of something that had a hold. They look at that person. They understand. I know where they're at. But that sister that was on the side of the road, Brother Stephen, she told me, she said she had got addicted. She started doing other types of illegal drugs. She said, I was so addicted. She said, I lived right over here in Errol Estates. And if my memory serves me correctly, she said, I lived in a house. I want to say it was around $400,000 house. But today she's on the side of the street. She said, and this is when she broke. She said, I was a preacher's daughter. I mean, this was when my kids were still small. And all I could think about was my own kids. Huh? I would to God we'd get on the right side of the road, folks. Amen. Right now, there's somebody out there hurting while we're here in church. But she said, I, I was a preacher's daughter. And she said, My parents tried to do me right and raise me and everything. And she said, But I, I strayed away. And she said, I got to the point that when my husband found out what I was doing, she said, I started trying to hide it. She said, I would go off and do it in other places. 
She said that my husband came to me numerous times and he told me, you're wrecking our marriage, you're wrecking our home, you're destroying everything. I don't want our children to see what you've been doing and what you are becoming. Her, her husband tried to put up with it for the longest time and she was bawling her eyes out for the day but on the side of 441 and she said, finally my husband said, I cannot take it anymore. Get out of the house and don't ever come back. He kicked her out of that $400,000 house or whatever it was. And then she said, I've lost my children. I've lost my marriage. I've lost everything and I've got nothing left. You know that man that was laying on the side of the road, he lost it all. He had no money. They stole it all. He had no dignity. He stayed, took it off of him. Come on, somebody you left for half dead. Let me tell you, when the enemy gets done with you, he'll leave you dead, dead bleeding on the side of the road. Somebody say, well, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost this morning. But as that woman began to tell me that story, she said, I don't know what to do with my life. On the side of 441, I know she's a prostitute, but I knew everybody in town could see. And then what I was doing, I reached over and I got a hold of that woman's hand. I said, let's pray right now. Sometimes you don't know what to say because you ain't got no answer. Somebody say that. Sometimes you don't know how to feel because you may not have the answer. But I grabbed that woman by the hand and I said, I'm praying God save you. I'm praying God redeem you. I'm praying God put your family back together. My God in heaven, thank God for somebody that will stop. Somebody that's on the right side of the road. Those of you that are acquainted with our news and media, within just the last few days, it has become national news. As just a handful of this, the Lord reminded me of this this morning. As some young men sat back and recorded a man as he drowned right there in front of them. They laughed and made fun and, until a man died right there in front of them. I'm going to tell you, as much as I hate to tell you this, I've seen a lot of our church folks are just like that. When you come to our level, we'll help you. When you meet our qualifications and our expectations, we'll help you. Huh? I know this ain't popular, but I'm preaching anyway. Well, whenever you get, when you come, when you come up to the level, we'll do something for you. When you show that you're serious, I'll do something for you. Huh? Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? Now you got all kind of opinions. You can say a lot of stuff you want to say. But at the end of the day, God didn't call us to size people up. God didn't call us to figure out whether or not they deserve it or whether they don't deserve it. But God called us to run down into the battle. Get down on our hands and knees. Get us some bandage and some oil and some wine. Pour it in their wounds. And do whatever it takes to get them better. You see, what's important and what is incredible to me is the fact, Sister Kathy, I don't want to miss this. As a matter of fact, I never saw it until I was looking over it again this morning and the Lord reminded me of this because I've read over it before and never picked up on this. But the Bible said that when He put him on that beast, in my mind I'm thinking to myself, what a chore it must have been to get a half-dead man who can't help himself. There's a lot to be said of that. There's a lot of people that cannot help themselves and if somebody else don't help them, they're going to die. Some of you here this morning, you got children and grandchildren and family members, a husband, a wife, people that you love. That if they don't get help, they're going to die. But here's this man. He puts him up on the beach for the sea. And the Bible said he took him to an end. I'm led to believe this probably took place in the late evening. A lot of things happened on the cover of darkness. And so they, he takes him to the end and he tells him, I'm going to give you two pence. Here's the part that I've never picked up on before. The Bible said on the morrow. On the morrow, he tells the innkeeper, here, I'm giving you some money and I'm going to come back by this way later and if I owe you more, I'll pay it. First of all, this man is making sacrifices out of his own pocket. Folks, you say what you want to, but when people dig in their pockets, you know it's not real. Huh? <clears throat> You know, talking about people being selfish and stingy when it comes to their money, they'll give you about anything, but they won't give you money. A lot of times, if they don't know. But this was the part that really stuck to me. 
It said on the morrow. You know what that means? That means this man, whether it was during the day, late afternoon, evening, this man took him on his beast to the inn and stayed with him all night. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but it just does something for me. And when I read that part and it hit me, I know there's a lot of beautiful things this man did, but for some reason, because I see a lot of times in churches and the people and with the help and what we may minister, we may say, well, here, here's a few dollars. We'll get you something to eat. But this is the equivalent of a man saying, I'm taking you to a hotel. I'm going to pay for you somewhere to stay. And I'm staying with you on my own. And when I get up in the morning and I leave out because I do have responsibilities of my own, that we turn and we say, I will make sure this man as far as I know, Brother David, he don't know who this guy is. He knows that many of the Jews absolutely detest and hate the Samaritans. And I want to tell you something. Whenever Jesus told that parable, that pharisaical lawyer who sat back and said, who is my neighbor? And the Lord told that parable and he said, do just like that. In other words... You sit back, you're so pious, you think you've got all the law down pat, but you've got certain people you won't fellowship, certain people you won't have nothing to do with. And I tell somebody that I am personally sick and tired of my guts of missing souls that we could help just because we're trying to maintain a, a certain image about us. Well, I'm church of God, or I'm so and so holiness, or I'm whatever, whatever. Let me tell you, I'm don't care anymore what anybody says about me. Let them say whatever they want to. Let them broadcast. Let them talk about me behind my back while they sit there with their little cult of us for it no more. You say what you want to, but you're just as bad as that Pharisee, that Levite, that priest traveling down the road. You got your head up in the air. And if they don't look like you, they don't act like you, don't talk like you, don't come from the same background as you. Is anybody else besides me? say we need to move beyond say amen somebody amen we've got to a place in America I can tell you that some have moved forward but I can tell you as sure as I'm standing here I have stayed in parsonages as an evangelist of people who will sit around a dinner table cut jokes and make fun of people of other races. Then go people to their face. Oh, hey, how you doing? So good to have you. You say you want to grow a church? Well, I got news for you. There ain't going to be a soul section in heaven, a Hispanic section in heaven, and a white folks section in heaven, and some Jamaican folks in another section. We are all created from one blood. That means that we all bleed the same way. I know that we may have cultural differences, uh, but at the end of the day, I'll never forget whenever God saved me, how God revealed it to me. I was standing in Walmart of all places, uh, and I remember they were taking that machine with all them color paints uh, on a wheel, and then they would create a certain color. They would put a can of white paint up on that wheel, and then they would want to create red. Uh, that thing, they would punch in a number, and that thing would turn around the wheel to this color. And it would squirt two or three drops of that color. It would turn around to another color. Squirt two or three drops of that turn around. And keep doing that until they had created the right color. I asked that man, I said, what would you refer to that paint that you put in there? He said, all we're trying to do is change the pigmentation of the color. Let me tell you something. We may have narrower face, narrower nose, wider nose, bigger head, smaller head, bigger feet, taller people. Soda. It doesn't matter. All it is is pigmentation, friend. And if you can't minister to somebody, that means help just because they ain't the same brand, the same color, the same culture, the same background. You are in bad shape. Tell me that you're going to the same heaven. You can't kneel on the same altar, worship on the same platform, pray around the same place. 
me tell you something. You ain't going to the same place. And it goes the same for the stuck up crowd that thinks they got it all figured out and they're so narrow and stinky minded. They got certain top ten lists of do's and don'ts and they preach about it every single service and they spend more time talking about the church down the road than everybody else. You know what I feel like? You know what? Whatever they do down the road, God bless them. I hope they win some souls. But it's time we move to the right side of the road. I Somebody this morning, uh, is there anybody at Great Street that says, Pastor, I'm right here behind you. Come here, Brother Eric, come in and hey, come here. Hey, and we brought Brother Eric on as another member right here this morning. Uh, I want you to just stand right behind me and follow me around. You see what I need, what the church needs uh, is some people that say, here we're with you. We're on the right side of the road. I'm tired of feeling like I'm on the wrong side. I'm tired of looking down my nose. I don't care if they do like smell like that, like talk like they like it doesn't matter anymore God called me to have charity even charity will kill it all say man, charity will trump all if you just have charity when we get to the place that we're willing to work together come on now brother Mike You've shared with me some of your own personal testimony and sometimes I think there may be internal fears within us that somebody may not approve of us or think highly of us. Let me tell you something. Now, I mean this with all my heart. God knows what I'm saying. When I look at men like you, I'm not looking at you like, well, you're not me. You're not like me. You're not, you're not as good as me. Not at all. Something broke in my spirit whenever I got saved one night. Whenever I was praying down at an altar and I got up from prayer, you heard me tell the story. And I turned around and Black Mother Mike Ingram was standing there with his arms open. And it was like, what do you do? I was raised prejudiced. Hey man, a lot of my family, if somebody came on TV, I'm just preaching this morning. I hope somebody getting something out of this. If somebody came on that television that wasn't the same color or the right color, as I get that mess off my TV and turn it. Come on, if some of them were alive today, they wouldn't even be able to watch TV. Say amen. And thank God for it. I had that jump in bread of me as a child by many of those that I loved. And I'm going to tell you something. The night that God broke that jump out of me, there's some of you, the reason why you can't help nobody, the reason why that you can't get on the wrong, right side of the road, is that you're hung up on the wrong. You're hung up thinking like everybody. Let me tell somebody. There's some of you that's going to have my mom I taught me, my dad told me, my grandmammy told me whoever told you, hear this preacher this morning, uh, I don't care who told you, it doesn't matter what they said, if what they said does not line up with the holy red word of God, you better get back to the Bible, son, you better get on the right side of the road uh, there's peace on the right side there's healing on the right side we're going to fill up a church on the right side we're going to fill up a choir on the right side Anybody sideways, crossways, or even here's a very common mentality. Come on, walk with me. Brother Steve, come up here and lay down where you you got beat up. Let's lay on the floor. Don't hurt yourself. You gotta work as we can all stay out bills today. You remember those. And then, when you finally get you some help, and you finally get up on your feet, and now they want you in their church. I'm a preaching somebody. Sure, yes, sir. Oh, yeah, sure. 
Come on over and be a part of our church. Yeah, because somebody's done got you up on your feet. You got your life a little cleaned up now. But you know what? In the back of your mind, so no, I remember when I was laying there, my eyes were half cocked open. I remember where you were. You were on the wrong side of the road. You weren't there. You didn't care much about nothing. You didn't care if I lived or died. You walked right on by me. Don't go acting all spiritual. Don't go acting all holy right now. Let me tell you, some of you, there's a difference between feeling sorry for yourself. Come on now. And the reality of those who could care less. There are a lot of folks in this church that love you. And then some of you, you put up a wall so long uh, until people don't know how to act around you. That's a little bit different when you push people away and they can't get help to you. And somebody will get back and say, well, they were never there for me. Sometimes it ain't because they didn't want to. Sometimes it's because you put up such a stinky wall. You won't even let them get close to you. When they try to put oil and wood in their wounds, uh, you push them away. Come on. Yeah. There's going to come a time, come here, my brother, come here, brother. There's going to come a time when we all have somebody. And this has happened as sure as I'm standing here. You remember who it was. Of all people, that's the I want you to listen to me. I'm not going to garner sympathy here, but I want to state a fact. Me and my precious wife have been in places of our life where we were the first ones if somebody was in need, we would reach out to them. If somebody didn't have money, we would try to help them. If their car was broke down, we would try to help them. But then, our car was broke down. Or our life was in a mess. And I want to tell you, I know people can't do what they cannot do. But it would blow your mind. I thought about this the other day. How many times that it was not the church crowd, but it was somebody completely on the outside. An unlikely source. There's something you need to understand. I hope you haven't forgot this. When the church first got started, the Bible says, you see, they're facing opposition from every side. When the church first got started, the Bible said that they took their possessions, they sold them, they took the profits thereof, and they all came together. They lived as far as eating the food, they fellowshiped together, and they became one church in this respect. They took their money to survive together, and they gave it into the church. I'm not advocating anybody go rob your bank and give it to the church. What I'm saying is, is that they were willing to, to sacrifice their own to be able to help their brethren. We are in a church today. Come on now. I want to tell you something. We are living amongst people that say, well, yes, bless them, God. I'll pray for you. But there's a portion of the Bible where he said, there are those that may come along and say, be fed, be clothed. Well, that sounds great. But what have you done to help them be fed? And what have you done to help them be clothed? Anybody can say, I'll pray for you. Bless God, I'll pray for you. A lot of times they don't even really pray for you. Well, I'll pray for you. Thank God for the people. He said, well, look here. I ain't got very much. Come here, brother Eric. Come here. Brother Steve, I ain't got very much. Who you got a wallet on you? Who you wallet out? And I don't have very much. What you got? You got a five? You got four? You got I got three here. That ain't very much. Right? I don't have a lot. But what I do have, we're gonna pitch in and work together. <laughs> Folks, that keyboard that's up there. I know some may look as well, Pastor. I don't even think we need one. We got that baby grand piano. Just play that over there. I ain't giving them nothing because I don't. I don't believe. Listen, I don't understand that. I mean, I understand people got their own opinions about that. You got to do whatever you got to do, honey. But I thank God, and I'm not gonna call no names. But I'm gonna thank God for little things like this of people that have got the vision that they're on the right side of the road. Amen. 
And you know the reason why a lot of churches don't grow is because we got some on one side of the road and some on the other. But I thank God. I took up an offering for this keyboard. I'm not going to, I'm not criticizing anybody. Please don't misunderstand me. But some of the most unlikely people that normally may not be here or may not give made it happen. I shared my vision of that church back there, the children's church ministry with the little babies back there that we said, well, we love them. Let me tell you something this morning. As a church, I believe in my God to help us, Sister Kathy, Amen. to get on the right side of the road. Amen. You know the reason why 120 believers in the upper room, Brother Mike, got together? Because they may have started out, some say, with 500 before it was over with 120 people got on the right side of the road. Some of us said, well, I'd love for us to be able to have a homeless ministry. I'd love for us to be able to have a nursing home ministry. I'd love for us to come here and see the pews filled up with people that just started coming. I'd love to see people getting saved in the altars and so forth. I've been criticized as a pastor since I've been here because we don't have as many people get saved in this church as somewhere else. Let me tell you the reason why that is. It's not always because I'm not a better preacher. Some of it has to do with the fact that the sheep are not going out there bringing more sheep in here. I preach to a, and I'll reach to a, if you'll get them in here. Amen. But if God puts you in this church, and you are working in another man's ministry, another place, how can you say anything about this church? If you're not a part of the solution, don't be a part of the problem. Say amen, somebody. I'll tell you what will happen is when you get a part of that 120 and you get over here and you say, I'm going to get on the right side of the road on the high grace street church of God. That's what's going to happen to this church. We are going I'm going to try to close with this thought here this morning. I want to tell you, this morning, as a pastor, as a man of God, as a preacher, I'm giving a direct challenge from the Lord that those of us that are here, part of this church, to take on a new endeavor in our life. What is that, Brother Myers? I want us to become soul winners. I'm not asking us to be pew warmers. Platform ministry is great. But if we don't have a kingdom ministry in other places, we're just going to get up here and entertain each other. I'd love to see some drug addicts getting delivered in the altar. I mean, still these in the Oh, yes. I told a man the other night, I said just the other day, and it was yesterday, I said, Brother, I said, we are, God's been dealing with my heart about seeing souls getting saved and ministries born. And I said, you know, I'm going to tell you something. I've described it like this. Everybody's got their way of explaining things. I said, but I am not. I said, no, I know people from time to time, they move from place to place because God deals with them. And I said, I believe that God's will can be in that. And I said, but I personally, I said, I'm not in the church checkers. Come on now. Anybody know? Know how to play checkers? And come on, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, you know what, what that is? That means we're going to take this piece and we move it over here to this church. And we're going to take this piece over here and move it over to this church. And, and then you get this church that gets 25 of somebody else's members. And we're experiencing growth. And yes, I know that sometimes uh, that the will of God is accomplished in that fashion. But honey, how many of you would say, Pastor, let's get beyond church checkers. Uh, let's find somebody that ain't been to church in years. Let's find a homeless man laying in a tent with mosquitoes all around the outside of it. Let me find somebody who's actually on God, who don't even love God. Somebody that nobody in this church even knows. Come on, preacher. You feel what I'm saying, Brother Steve? I'm going to tell you the only way it's going to happen is if we get on. As you stand across this house, Miss my daughter come play something for me. I want you to listen to this. I want you to stand all across the house. I want you to listen to verse 31 and 32. Are you listening to me this morning? I want you to pay attention this way. I'm going to give you a minute because I want you to hear this. I want this to set in. You may say, Pastor, you preach it every which way that is. And I want this to set in. Verse 31 said, And likewise a Levite 
that said whenever he was at the place, he even looked on him. He can't claim he didn't see him. He can't even look at him. And the Bible said, and passed by. And then in verse 32, verse number 31, when it talked about the priest, the arrogant said, by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. You know how sad that is? He purposely distanced himself. That makes my spirit cringe. Man, if we as a people of God don't have any more concern about souls, why don't we just fold our hands, close the door, go to the house? Without any more, we're going to do. We're not going to do that. We're going to take a new generation of Gray Street folks together and we're going to say, even if I don't feel like I'm on the wrong side totally, Pastor Myers, I've been walking down the middle of the road and I've been avoiding a lot of stuff, but this morning, I'm headed. I'm, I'm going to ask God this morning to help me get on the right side of the road and this is what I believe is going to happen. This is what I believe is going to happen. And I'm claiming this in the name of Jesus. The sister farmer, we're going to have people in Gray Street that are going to be in the marketplace. They're going to be on the job site. They're going to be around family and friends and all.